And the starting point here is that there's a lot of papers now in image synthesis in the vision conferences, the CBPR and ACCV. Uh, there's a lot of really nice stuff. Um, and in some sense, some of the most exciting stuff in the field. Um, and we've seen a lot of you know stuff that I left out that was earlier today, and uh, I don't have room for everything on the slide. And this isn't just a fringe phenomenon. Some of the award-winning papers or nominees are essentially computer graphics papers, including the Mara Prize winner from ICC. This ICTV, essentially a computer graphics paper, image synthesis. Um, and so I've always thought of SIGGRAPH as the, the most exciting place to publish my graphics work. It's really a place I think a lot of people have seen as this is where you publish stuff like this. But this year, there's 124 graphics papers at SIGGRAPH 2020. Um, whereas at CDPR this year, there are 93 that declare their primary subject area as image and video synthesis, 29 as neural generative models, and so on. So it seems like, in some sense, there are more graphics papers happening at CDPR than at SIGGRAPH, which is like a really strange turn of events in some ways. Um, and I, I shared my talk title with um, some colleagues on Facebook, uh, and the first response was, oh man, CDPR is absolutely a graphics conference. Uh, and the second response was, it does stand for computer vision and painting and rasterization, right? Um, so I feel like this is something worth talking about, um, discussing you know, a little bit, what does this mean? Uh, how do these fields differ? How do these venues differ? Um, and I wanna say just a little bit about what I see as being kind of blind spots in vision publication and reviewing. Um, and I know a lot of people I'm sure attending and certainly a lot of speakers have uh, experience with SIGGRAPH. And I view a lot of these comments maybe for people who don't have experience with SIGGRAPH or the graphics venues have, have really come from a pure vision background. Um, so I would first start off by talking about how things got this way. And sort of one uh, factor, I think, is certainly the publication styles of these venues are different. And in SIGGRAPH, it kind of feels like every paper you write, you're constructing this beautiful masterpiece of getting everything just right with you know, artistically constructed, single origin, shade grown, everything is perfect. Whereas uh, computer vision often feels like this mass you know, stampede where you're just rushing to get that damn paper out the door as fast as possible uh, before you get scooped by 15 archive uh, competitors. So there are a lot of pros and cons to these different kinds of approaches, but you know, one thing we've seen is the pace of progress in computer vision recently has been just staggeringly fast. Um, but there's, there has been a long history of uh, generative models in vision, and we saw in this morning talks that use the notion of analysis by synthesis. We saw a lot of computer graphics models in the construction of these different representations. And generally, there has been at times expressed this belief that building vision systems requires understanding the image formation process. One area where this has, I think, been strong this has been in the notion of texture modeling. Uh, I think a lot of the significant work in texture discrimination has had a part of the paper where they randomly sample from the model, generate texture in order to understand and validate uh, and just test out their texture discrimination model. And this has led to papers in vision on texture synthesis, the graphic problems. So this is work by Efres and Lung in 99, which is a uh, really nice work in creating textures and examples in similar spirit. Um, and just to briefly mention my own work, this um, led to my own work at SIGGRAPH on um, style transfer, generating text um, paintings from a single example of that style or conditional layout of uh, scenes based on, on texture from an example. Um, and there was also a, a similar paper from Afros and Freeman in the same session. Um, so to talk about what this means, we think of computer graphics as being, uh, SIGGRAPH as being about computer graphics and interactive techniques. Computer vision is about computer vision. But those sort of short descriptions are actually incomplete. I don't think that's really what these conferences are about. So let's look at SIGGRAPH, for example. Um, about 30 years ago or more, basically people thought computer graphics and SIGGRAPH were about re realistic rendering and animation, uh, geometric modeling. But most of this, the papers that people thought of as being computer graphics were really about rendering. Uh, but by the time I started attending SIGGRAPH, there had been this explosion of topics of things that people had not thought of graphics 10 years before of uh, image-based rendering and you know, generating cartoons and uh, modeling, uh, modifying videos and tap haptic tangible interfaces and VR storytelling. And even today, looking at this year's uh, SIGGRAPH uh, papers that are coming out soon, there's just this incredible diversity of interesting ideas and new things that people had not even thought to publish on the previous year. And I think, and I'm, I'm very excited about the, this coming program. Um, and I think part of the success of SIGGRAPH has been from this like really 
openness to uh, new problem statements and new ideas that were not what had been previously been, been considered computer graphics. And so I would argue that really the topic of the conference is not computer graphics and inter interactive techniques or computer vision, it's what interests the community. So as another example, um, SIGGRAPH is now um, have, has a lot of publications on computational fabrication uh, and computer aided design of like essentially physical structure. And this is not something that was computer, considered computer graphics 20 years ago, but it's something that's like really appropriately fits the kind of interest and skills that the computer graphics community has. Um, one way this sort of has manifested in the past was if a reviewer wrote, I haven't seen that problem before, at SIGGRAPH that means, oh, I'm excited, probably accept the paper. Whereas it used to be envisioned that that meant reject, that vision reviewers used to say, this, this, this problem has been worked on in vision before, it's probably not computer vision. And that seems like that's really changed, and this is really one positive thing for the vision community. Um, but to think about what the uh, um, community likes, I think it's perhaps also interesting to think about who are the people attending. Um, and I have this stereotype, I, mean, I don't know if this is how accurate this is, but I have this impression that a lot of vision people, certainly of the older generation of vision researchers, got inspired uh, by vision, by the book Vision by David Marr, by Colonel Lesha Bach, by seeing science fiction, uh, versions of AIs, and they wanted to build psychopathic space AIs. Um, so they're really um, motivated by the idea of modeling and understanding intelligence. Um, for a lot of us computer graphics people, um, we started out being interested in art. So for me, I um, made animations when I was a kid. I watched a lot of animation, went to experimental animation festivals and movies of Pixar and so on. I studied art in college. I did a lot of painting. And I think you know everyone's different and different people have sort of different backgrounds, but uh, a lot of graphics people really start from a place of wanting to create and enable art. And so there's these sort of two sort of stereotypical viewpoints, I think, from the AI and vision point of view, creating images and creating art are really kinds of intelligence that, that we want to model. So we take whatever tools we have for um, modeling intelligence, and we just apply that to art. And in the extreme um, sort of caricature of that, it's like we take all of our art, feed it into our supervised model, and then we can make more art. And the graphics viewpoint is, like, is start from a really different point of view, that algorithms and software are tools for art and expression. Uh, and a lot of this comes from the SIGGRAPH community's uh, interaction with games and visual effects community, as well as the fact that a lot of people in graphics have some kind of art background or some connection with the arts. And all of these fields is this very strong experience that um, that these this pieces of software are ultimately things that you, people use to create art or to express themselves or communicate with each other. And so what this means, you know, to some extent, is that the CVPR publication process cares about automation and it cares about quantitative evaluation, whereas SIGGRAPH cares a lot more about user control and the visual qualities of the results. Um, and so, you know, one sort of extreme example of this is that um, at CVPR, if your paper has some user steps where the user specifies a few things as input, that can hurt you with the reviewers. Whereas with SIGGRAPH, if your paper is, if your method is completely automatic and has no user control whatsoever, that can hurt you with the reviewers. So it's like just very different um, uh, emphasis in the interest here. And I, I want to emphasize, I don't think there's any right or wrong uh, to these points of view. They all, all these different approaches have a lot of value. Um, and part of the, another factor I think that uh, CDPR has made such good strides here is that um, uh, SIGGRAPH has not really embraced machine learning methods until recently. And this is something I've, I've, I've spoken, you know, written about before as well. Um, I have had no problem publishing machine learning work at SIGGRAPH, but I think that there is, and I think because SIGGRAPH is so open to different ideas, but a lot of graphics review researchers have been uh, um, uh, resistant or uh, reticent about uh, adopting these techniques. And even five years ago, I was hearing people say, oh, it's deep learning stuff, it's just a fad, I don't really know that it really works. And so this is why SIGGRAPH has not been the innovator that CVPRI has. Um, there's a few things that I think it's worth pointing out that CVPRI has not been as good at when it comes to image synthesis techniques. Um, these are things of, around focusing on the aesthetics and visual quality of the work. Uh, but I can you know, mention the paper by uh, Gaddis et al, Neural Style Transfer. And I feel you know, confident, feel comfortable saying you know, a few skeptical things about it because it's clearly such an important paper, seminal work, very, very important. Um, how, however, like the, you know, the visual results, and some of them, honestly, I don't think they look that good. 
they're in advance in the state of the art, but they don't really a lot of times capture the visual style of the artwork that they're starting from, um, which is fine in a research paper, it's in advance. But these are things worth discussing. And I feel like there's been a lot of follow-up work that has basically just treated it as like, okay, now you just do the same thing, but with slightly faster or few shot or something. Um, and it's not really, it's not really like people paying attention to what are the qualities that these artworks have and how do we model those. Human motion is another place where historically CDPR is, you know, vision research has not been so good at looking at the images themselves. And so we've had, you know, this has changed, I think, a bit recently, but um, we've had a lot of papers that have these MATLAB bone structure visualizations of motions, and there's no skin model, there's no ground plane, there's no cast shadows, and you just cannot tell from these images if the motion is looking any good. In contrast, I would point to, for example, some of the early work of David Salison's group and his students at UW, and, and then when those students became professors. These, these papers were really great models for how do you qualitatively discuss the visual phenomenon going on in a, in a particular scene, for example, in this uh, hatching illustration from their work. Um, they, you break apart what are the things that make this visual phenomenon what it is, and then um, create systems that capture these visual phenomena. There's no quantitative evaluation paper, there's no numbers, um, but this result here, I mean, I think, you know, obviously this is a beautiful picture they were able, able to render, and you can see if you go through the paper how it captured the goals that they set out to achieve. Similarly, in character animation, uh, we spend a lot of time looking at the motions and comparing them to the real phenomenon. So this is some work that we did where we, we spent a lot of time comparing, like, do the footfalls happen in the same way for the character that they do for the real person? Because those are really perceptually salient to how we view the motion. Uh, we also spend a lot of time um, look, you know, understanding the physics and dynamics and how advanced groups think about these things uh, when trying to model these different phenomena in the world. Um, and I feel like in the vision learning world, there can be a little bit of a monomania around just a focus on learning. So this is a video from a uh, work that my students did a long time ago. Um, and the video is probably playing very choppily, but it doesn't, it's not very important. But basically, um, they uh, built a uh, physics-based character controller based on elegant high-level principles from biomechanics and robotics, and were able to demonstrate all of these different uh, capabilities it had. And I gave talks on this work at some learning venues like CIFAR and Snowbird. And each time I presented it, there'd be some person in the talk in the audience who'd say, ask me about the training data or which step was before or after learning. And I, these questions are flabbergasted me because there's no learning whatsoever in this work. And, in, and it never mentioned learning or training data in the talk. And it, somehow it's just assumed that there must be. Um, but my point is that you can do a lot of really valuable work uh, that doesn't involve machine learning. I know this, is, this seems really shocking. That being said, I think the best work combines this kind of modeling with machine learning. And so, for example, um, I see there's a paper at SIGGRAPH coming up from Michael Vandepan and others that use the kinds of um, low dimensional representations we had in this paper together with uh, reinforcement learning. One other um, point I want to make is that the, the emphasis on quantitative evaluation can be dangerous. Um, quantitative evaluation is a really valuable thing. It's really been important for the field to move forward with the Millbury data sets and uh, ImageNet. Um, but it can also be dangerous if all we care about are, are focusing on numbers. And I feel like I, I see this with NAC and so on, that vision reviewers can be overly obsessed with quantitative evaluation, even when that evaluation is not meaningful. It's, it feels like you read a paper, you got to have a table of numbers, and there's not necessarily a lot of thought into whether those numbers really are an important part of uh, making the convincing case in the paper that you have a good idea. Um, and, uh, you, and, and sometimes those evaluations are actually not very well performed and not very well constructed. Um, and I have some references on the slide for more, for some discussions of that top topic in other venues, but I think a lot of that applies for vision as well. Um, one positive note here is that I think a lot of the interesting work happening in the vision venues is coming from graphics researchers. And so this really nice sort of um, melding of cultures of people coming to get, bringing ideas from different places together. Uh, and a lot of the um, interesting work going on, you see maybe one of the authors has a lot of experience with, with SIGGRAPH or even they come from a graphics lab. Um, and that's, and that's, and that's, I think that just kind of shows in the quality of the results. In particular, I'd point to uh, Yako uh, Lechman's graph lab at uh, NVIDIA. Um, they develop style GAN, progressive GAN, a lot of great work in this area. 
all of these people, as far as I know, have PhDs in, in computer graphics. They did their theses on ray tracing and rendering stuff. And now they're doing all this great work in GANs. And they will tell you that they're, they have been successful in making really great GAN techniques because of their experience in, back, in graphics and their focus on the visual quality of the results and their attention to the visual details and how things look. Uh, I just briefly plugged uh, some of my own work in this space. We have a paper coming up on uh, Wednesday on uh, for line drawing of 3D meshes. And this is a place where we have um, combined ideas from the recent um, image translation works, uh, pix to pix as well as more uh, older techniques from computer graphics, just to get the best of both worlds. And I feel like a lot of my best research ideas these days are taking ideas from older ideas from computer graphics research and combining them with um, new ideas in machine learning and, uh, and deep learning. I also want to briefly uh, plug our GAN space work, which is online and archive and YouTube. Uh, here we're able to uh, learn interesting directions within a pre-trained GAN without any uh, supervision whatsoever. So you give us a GAN you've trained, and we will tell you essentially what are the interesting directions that this model uh, has learned. Um, so uh, in, the nice thing about this is it's a super simple method, easy to implement, which I think is an advantage. And it's also something where um, there's no, um, I don't think there's any meaningful quantitative evaluation we can do. I think you read this paper, you watch the video, you get a sense for what it does. Um, and you know we could throw in a pro forma quantitative evaluation because you got to have some numbers in your paper, but I just don't see what what it would what value it would actually have. Um, so uh, I've maybe made a few comment points here, but I would say that my kind of my message I feel like both these approaches have uh, their strengths and their weaknesses between kind of the way these people do things at CPR and at SIGGRAPH. But if SIGGRAPH is if CPR is going to be a place that publishes graphics papers that you know is becoming like a first tier, ven tier venue for graphics, which seems like a bizarre situation, but I think it should be open to uh, this, um, this work, which is more focused on visual quality. And I would encourage people who want to work in this space to, to adopt this mindset, read more say graph papers, and think more about how do the images look and not just uh, what are the scores that you're getting. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you, Alan. That was great. Yeah, thank you. Um, so a couple of questions from the uh, from the audience. Uh, so Arslan Basharat uh, is asking, are there lessons learned on best practices for quantification from other fields that you are aware of and that you might recommend for the vision community to follow? Um, yes, so I think you know, there's, a, there's a bunch of, there's a lot of issues and you know, the, the short version is it's complicated. Um, in that paper by Greenberg and Buxton, I think, uh, where they're specifically talking about quantification in HCI is a really nice sort of argument that in different types, types of um, times in the design and research process, you want different kinds of evaluation. Um, uh, I think, you know, support, so the first question is what exactly is the point of your study? What are you trying to prove? Um, there's a lot of very specific things about the way that you run user studies that um, are important. Like you should, you know, randomize your your uh, your stimuli and make sure that the people can't tell which ones are from your work versus the other work, uh, and um, so on. There's also, you know, there's a lot of work, a lot of study of the replication pri uh, crisis in psychology and other fields where you have to have p less than 0.05 to publish a paper, and then people have essentially learned intentionally or unintentionally how to completely hack that and publish unreproducible work, but always getting that, that, that score. Um, so I would say, you know, the short answer is kind of, you know, look at some of those other uh, venues because it's, it's pretty complicated. I think just kind of along those same lines, uh, Animesh Karnavar is saying that um, getting qualitative assessments, for example, from Mechanical Turks, uh, from Mechanical Turks is not always possible, uh, maybe because of budgets. Uh, However, if we wish to pronounce the focus on perceptive qualitative results, there's always the risk of cherry picking results. So how do you propose like, you know, a middle ground between like quantitative and quantitative qualitative evaluations? Um, well, I guess I would sort of see, I don't think, you know, again, like I don't know there's a simple answer, but I would sort of say, say that there, I, I think of there being kind of two regimes or two extremes. One extreme is we, you know, we present a simple method that um, takes an input, an output and you can understand from the algorithm when it's going to work and when it's not going to work 
and we show you know a bunch of here a bunch of cases where it works really well. Um, and from that, you can you know, sometimes as a reader, you can be pretty convinced that they've done a good job, and they've uh, the authors have sort of clearly communicated why it, it works and doesn't work. Um, and, and you maybe you're willing to trust the authors uh, in that in some some cases. In other cases, you know, like if the, the claim is this is going to work on every image or work on 80% of images, um, or the advantage over the previous work is much more subtle and it's really more like, well, in this case, it kind of makes more sense, it might work better, it might not, then it seems like you really need to do a much more rigorous and thorough evaluation and be able to make the case that um, your scores are actually meaningful. And Adosha has a question. Most of my students are obsessed with FID because they want a number. Do you have any advice for them? Uh, I mean, uh, <laughs> I mean, yeah, I, you know, you know, I think there's three things, you know, either we you improve the culture of the field or we improve our evaluation metrics um, or, you know, I've been told that FID is, you know, better FID like kind of means that you, you do it a little bit better. Um, uh, but I don't know, you know, I don't know if a good answer for that. Actually, I, I had a question. I mean, I guess you're suggesting that some of the ways uh, in vision we evaluate our work is not great, but you also said that some of the, like, you know, nicest work in like graphics topics is now happening in CBPR and not in the graphics conferences. So like, how do you kind of put those two together? Um, well, I think people who are doing well in these areas have figured out how to do good, good at, um, do a good job of both of like making beautiful images and also reporting good FID scores. Mm -hmm. um, I think we have a few more questions. So Mingyu is actually asking, uh, do you think it's a good idea for CVPR to accept art papers? I, my, I mean, I'm not guessing it depends what you mean by an art paper. I mean, I would say uh, if you mean art paper by like, Here's my artwork that I did. I don't think it makes any sense for that to be in a technical trap because we don't know, CVPR doesn't know how to evaluate those kinds of papers and it's such a different culture. Um, I think papers that are, you know, computer vision or computer graphics tools for artistic tools can are potentially useful. I mean, I'm not sure if I'm answering the right question. Okay. Um, and, uh, and David Scott Hayden's asking, uh, in discussing the strengths of SIGGRAPH, you emphasize strengths being a focus on visual quality and also intelligent example physics-based modeling. So how do you weight the importance of these two things? So visual quality and physics-based modeling. Um, I, I don't think I can weigh these things and say that one is more important than the other. It depends on the, you know, on the topic. I think that even, I would say like even in our, our work on physics-based modeling and character animation, we are building these physical models with a goal to produce uh, results that are visually accurate. And we believe that we will make more perceptually uh, uh, appealing or accurate results by modeling the physics in certain ways. And we're going to ignore parts of the physics that don't seem salient to the, the visual quality of the results. Okay. I think that basically wraps up the Q&A session.